Hello, leaders of the world. Welcome to Spread Love and Organizations, a podcast for purpose-driven healthcare leaders striving to make life better around the world by leading their teams with genuine care, servant leadership, and love. I'm Naji, your host, joined today by Mokhtar Diallo, founder and CEO of Mongabe. Dedicated to transforming global pharma data interactions, Mokhtar brings over two decades of expertise in creating cutting-edge business intelligence systems, leading change management and transformative data architecture for multinational commercial operations. At Manga Bay, Mokhtar leads a team of data and analytics experts, driving commercial data operations focusing on lean, open, and unified data ecosystems. Mokhtar's impact extends beyond technology and operations. He's passionate about helping top-level business leaders navigate enterprise-wide change. Prior to Mangabe, Mokhtar successfully led business intelligence teams at Sanofi and Bristol-Myers Squibb. Mokhtar, it's a pleasure to have you with me today. Hi, Naji. How are you? All good. I'm really interested and intrigued first if you can share with us your personal story. What brought you to the pharma industry and now becoming uh, an entrepreneur and passionate about data and healthcare? Um, so first of all, thanks for inviting me to your uh, podcast and uh, I'm very delighted to, you know, to discuss with you today and, uh, and share some of my experience, uh, you know, starting with pharma. Um, I've started in pharma 20 years ago, as you as you mentioned, uh, and it was pretty random uh, originally. I um, before that I was working in data. Uh, I had some um, after school. I had some uh, interim jobs, um, you know, um, trying to uh, basically earn my life. I uh, I was kind of a dropout school. Uh, I had the talent in. Um, in computing that I've developed very early in my uh, in my life, very young. Um, I was good at school, but um, when I left my home and uh, and started to go to high school, um, I started to get prepared for um, uh, you know engineering school. But um, the level was too high for me in a way. Uh, the pressure was really high. I was far away from my family, and uh, and I had a kind of um, Kind of a dual uh, way of of being. I could be very serious, really hardworking, and very uh, determined to uh, to succeed in uh, in uh, getting good marks and uh, and so on. But I was a kind of a rebel as well, um, and uh, trying to uh, to figure out what would be my uh, my future uh, in a different way. And um, so I left school and I started to, to earn my life working uh, in different places. And, uh, and at some point in time, uh, I came back to, to data and IT, uh, working in different companies. Um, you know, uh, I started to work at uh, SHEP, uh, DHL, and, uh, and different places uh, that, uh, that would be, uh, you know, calling me for interim jobs. And after a while, I uh, finally started to work in uh, in a pharma company called, uh, called uh, Boots Healthcare. And, and Boots is a British-based company, but they had an affiliate in France, and we were selling uh, uh, OTC products. And that's where I started to uh, to get acquainted with uh, with data, with analytics, and and so on. Um, and after that, I had the opportunity to work at BMS, as you mentioned, and go there. Uh, in Paris, uh, working with different affiliates, um, living to the UK for two years, uh, and then uh, back to France working for Sanofi. Uh, that's where I've really, uh, um, you know, built my vision around what I was doing. And the first thing that really struck me was uh, the amount of waste of money that could happen in those companies to do something that was uh, potentially, uh, you know, optimizable to an extent that was unseen. Uh, and uh, I was seeing millions spent in project and, and so on where, you know, there would be opportunities to optimize and do a better job. And, um, and for me, we're talking about uh, the life of patients, we're talking about medicines, we're talking about healthcare, and the data was at the core of it. And um, 
the if you want the uh, the lack of uh, of professionalism, the, the lack of uh, of focus on making this data uh, right and uh, and optimize the cost managing it. Um, coming from where I'm coming, you know, I'm I'm coming from a, a very modest neighborhood. Um, that was for me uh, almost uh, indecent to see this and. Um, and as I had a kind of a talent managing uh, data, doing uh, some IT work and um, and building tools and algorithms and uh, and uh, and computing work, uh, I dedicated my uh, my time to to improve that, generate savings, and and trying to do a better job than than what I was seeing at the time. And um, and finally, after that, I've, I've made that my own uh, business with Mangabe and uh, the story horizon. Well, thanks, Mokhtar, for sharing this. I I'm intrigued. You said uh, coming from a uh, modest neighborhood and you, you shared uh, your upbringing and uh, now leading uh, data, a data company in healthcare. But you said specifically, it's indecent to see how the waste of money and even practically the waste of data management in, in those large organizations. Can you share a little bit more why what you saw and why you said it's indecent and linking it to your background as you shared? Yeah, I mean it's it's a strong word, but um, I wouldn't say that now. Uh, but back in time, when I was twenty seven and uh, and was trying to to make my my space, I was working really hard to to build systems and uh, and there were projects, um, similar projects around, uh, and people they were almost uh, building those projects to um, to do the things the way they were done uh, and the things the if you want the way they they had to be done uh, in a in a corporate environment, so you set up a budget, you you ask people uh, to run a project, and uh, and this tends to become very large. And and basically, doing data was a project, whereas people were working on data every day. And uh, some of those people they were building a real uh, knowledge on how to do this in a way that was way cheaper and way more organized. And those people, they were really undermined in the organizations. Um, so it was, uh, somehow it was me, uh, but uh, the more I started to know about the, the organization, the more I was working with countries and different places, I was connecting with similar people. They were always the people in the middle of the organization, um, you know, doing kind of IT work, data work, but that was crunching. That was the way we were calling those people the data crunchers 20 years ago. I mean, 15 years ago. And um, and for me, that was uh, it was difficult to see uh, big companies coming and uh, and running those projects for one year, two years. And at the end of those projects, people telling, OK, we, we tried. We learned a lot. We didn't do anything with, uh, with those millions invested. Uh, but at least we learned while those guys uh, managing the everyday data and trying to do their best to automate and to serve their, their colleagues, they were very undermined. So this you know, gap between we need data, that's the shiny thing, and, and the way people really working on it were treated on a daily basis, that, that gap was uh, to me um, a real, um, I mean, that was a real uh, issue. I, I love this, and it's really what, what you shared since the very beginning, right? You're a rebel and a, and a smart, uh, determined student. I feel within within the work and what you what you saw, uh, there was this gap. So, how did you deal with this gap? I imagine this is one of your leadership uh, learning, working from corporations to now building a company uh, where data is at the heart, and certainly what you said. Um, it, it's definitely true. Many times we talk about data, but at the end of the day, it's it's. I love how you framed it. It's a project. Um, well, our companies these days are more and more putting data at the heart of what we do and value it and really valuing it. But certainly for a while, it was more a project that someone would put and someone would stop. So how did you deal with this to now building a company? And what are your leadership learning uh, along your journey? I mean, um, 
had to be hands on. I had to go to the uh, to the ground of uh, of the needs, um, to the ground of um, of the data itself. I really had to to go really to the level, uh, the most granular level. Um, so I had to build very strong knowledge as to what is the data that exists, uh, what is the need that is out there, and and what can I bring that is uh, superior in terms of experience? Should it be faster access to the data, uh, best uh, or better visualization, um, fancy and, uh, and unseen uh, indicator? Uh, I think that building that knowledge and that know-how was really the base. But the second is, uh, is to value the work you do. The really, um, at, that, at the time I started, data was not uh, the shiny thing that uh, people are talking about today. Um, to, at that time, no CEO of a company would talk about data, no VP, no one would talk about data as such. And it's very recently that this started, but at that time, no one was believing in this. Uh, and um, so I had to believe in that. I had to believe in the value of data as a piece of communication, as data as a, as really a, a, a basically the um, the glue uh, that connects people uh, to each other in a modern organization. Um, I, we really had to believe this and to see this very clearly to to believe enough and and suffer the way you suffer because you're not valorized in the on the work you do with data at that time. Uh, that's second. And third, um, to work with early adopters. So I had the chance to, um, to work with people who were believing in this. So um, uh, some, uh, some of my managers, uh, uh, Delphine Aguilera Caron, uh, Ron Cooper, uh, Daniel Kinney, uh, um, those people from different horizons, uh, some of them uh, uh, French, but uh, working in the UK, some of them US people, because US guys are, are way more advanced in the way they see data than people in Europe as well. There is a cultural difference. Um, at that time, the US was already quite advanced as well uh, uh, versus Europe talking about data and, and leveraging data for, uh, for superior results. And I, I think those are the three elements, really building the, the knowledge, the know-how, Believing in um, in the in the vision, setting the vision, and really be uh, be loyal to that vision, and uh, and and third, uh, working with people who believe in you, uh, because you cannot. Uh, I wouldn't be where I am today without the support of of those key people I've mentioned and and others, uh, a lot of others who shared the vision and who love the the know how. That's a great framing, uh, Mokhtar. When, when you look back, really starting your company now, uh, would you do anything differently? Plenty. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's important when you when you start a company to to really strongly believe in the value you bring on the table. Um, because when you strongly believe uh, in that value, you, if you want, you um, you don't you don't sell it in a way that would be detrimental to yourself in the future. Uh, because you know, when you start a company, you're not necessarily sure of the value of what you're doing, and and you get a customer, and uh, and when you start to have a customer, everything the customer is telling you is uh, is is incredible. And, and you don't necessarily protect yourself of the consequences of some of the lines in the, some contracts and uh, some, um, if you want, uh, um, uh, behaviors that you undermine and so on. Um, and the return to reality can be uh, very, very difficult to manage. So I think it's important to really strongly believe in, in the value, to be uh, proud of it and protect yourself as much as possible. It's not easy. It's easier to say that after you started and, and, and seen the issues, but at least it's important to be conscious of the weaknesses that are there 
uh, in the relationship with with clients uh, as opposed to discover them uh, down the road and uh, and be a little bit naive so let's talk now about data your passion uh, your company focuses on lean open unified data ecosystems can you help us understand what do you mean by this and what is your personal vision and beliefs around data um, so the, you know the data we're working with is uh, the data is like a fluid okay it's like uh, it's like water uh, it's like a liquid it's something that needs to be consumed it it, it comes from different sources and and gets together uh, at some point in time for basically feeding uh, you know business insights and uh, and actions um, and to correctly pilot an organization which is supposed to be one body you need to assemble all, all this knowledge that's the uh, the basic thing you need to assemble all, all this knowledge at some point in time and an organization has this uh, magical effect of of moving different parts together um, but uh, but you know the brain is centralized somehow in an organization so the brain at some point in time needs to receive all the information you can have the the arm the legs the everything moving around but it's important as much as possible to be able to concentrate that information so i am a strong believer in uh, in data unification um, as opposed to uh, uh, data silos and one thing that uh, that happens when you have silos is that um, in, instead of uh, of having uh, data being a tool of performance, which it is when it is uh, transparently shared and and uh, and uh, you know assembled, it becomes uh, an instrument of self power when it's remained uh, in silo and so on. So people tend to keep the data for themselves because they, they believe that uh, this piece of intelligence is what makes their work more efficient. And I think it's not a modern idea. Uh, we are, we are uh, more and more uh, changing that and technology as well is, is pushing for a different uh, path. We see uh, generative AI, generative AI doesn't work with, uh, um, with big data, it works with diverse data. The more diversity you have, the, the the better the intelligence can be and that's and that uh, diversity comes from assembling data from different pieces of the organization as opposed to keep them in in silos and and uh, where they basically uh, uh, stay a little bit poor uh, we can say the same for human being and all those things you need to you know mix um, uh, informations for uh, getting the uh, through uh, richness yeah, I certainly agree with this. It's uh, it's fascinating how much data is actually siloed, you know, within our organization. And when we think about healthcare, the non-connectivity of the different data. You know, I, I'm thinking back when I was chief marketing officer and we were starting to do some pool databases and the complexity of making data connect. And more recently in, in France, I'm sure you're aware, all the work uh, the government is doing to connect data and and have some medical shared uh, platform and databases and the complexity of doing this, even though we would argue the the assurance maladie, so the healthcare system in France has all the data for us, but still nothing is talking to nothing for us to be able to predict and do better healthcare. A any thoughts about about those and probably pivoting from this to what's exciting about the future if we get to a unified uh, data system. Yeah, it's, um, it's incredible how um, artisanal, um, how, uh, uh, how much crafting is behind data. I mean, people don't imagine how much it is of manual work, of uh, uh, human interaction to make uh, to make sense of even raw data and, and build those assets. I think that's uh, that's something that people don't necessarily realize that it is a tedious work to to create a database to to work on it and so on. 
uh, we tend to see the really the, the last piece, which is the, the insights and the, the, the moment the data is, uh, is refined. Um, and that's what is, uh, is incredibly important, is the fact that it is a real effort, uh, a real conscious effort to make this happen. It, it won't happen um, automatically. Um, we, we work uh, at Mangabe, we work on a lot of strategies to make that happen, to facilitate that uh, transformation so that um, it's, it's effortless if you want. But, but the reality of the work of data management is a really tedious work, um, especially when the data doesn't have uh, the same format, uh, especially when the data hasn't been built in a way that it would uh, connect automatically with the, all the other pieces. All this work of unification, of stitching together different sources of information is something that needs to be done even that work needs to be done in a certain way. There are yeah. sciences to transform organizations and, and drive them towards the unification of their information systems. It's not only an, an IT work that says, okay, we're going to take a database, uh, you know, like, and structure it and, and make it happen. Um, if it was only this, all the, com the organization would be completely aligned for, for decades. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, and as you said, like this is the the heavy work that needs to get done. All executives, we get excited with like, oh, we clicked one, something and we saw it, right? Like data visualization is obviously what excites us. And, you know, you, you get whatever you need as an info, but really realizing the value that companies like yours or internal teams that work on those data to make sure that this data is relevant, well done, uh, you have categorization, all, well, all the things that you guys do is many times, as you said in the very beginning of this episode, many times not valued or not even seen. And, and it's all the people actually working to make sure that those are relevant, clean, correct, in the right categories, well transcripted, etc. is a key part for you to be able to visualize fast and most importantly, to get the right vision to make the decisions. Yeah. At, at the moment, just to rebound on that, at the moment, we we start to see the masses. As this is a, a subject that starts to be interesting for organization, we start to see the masses around what's the cost of data. Um, how can we maintain, especially in the post-pandemic where, you know, costs needs to be reduced and data is exploited because of digitalization and so on. We have an explosion of the amount of data to be managed by the organizations. And at the same time, there is a need to reduce the cost of this data. Data represent 5% of the revenue of companies. Okay, so that's a huge amount of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of um, basically financial transactions around data acquisition, around data management, around data consumption. And that needs to be kept at a level that, uh, that allows you know, to basically maintain and contain the explosion of this data. And that becomes a problem for organizations to, to make sure that they can still, uh, you know, grasp the, 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 the value of data, because if data goes in silos, we discussed that before, you cannot really grasp the benefit of it, but the cost of putting that together is so high that you need to work on optimizing that cost. So this is becoming a, a very strategic uh, issue for not only for pharma, I would say pharma perhaps a little bit more than other industries, um, but this is a real general problem for, uh, for any organizations. So I'm going to give you now a word, and I would love your reaction to it. The first one is leadership. Loneliness. Oh, say more. For me, leadership is a lot of loneliness. Um, thinking, 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 uh, and um, and that's yeah, that's the first reaction that I felt um, about leadership. Um, you listen a lot, uh, you think a lot, um, you you suffer a lot. Um, but mean, meanwhile, it's uh, it's extremely rewarding. What about change? It's uh, for me, change is bringing joy. 
I think there is nothing more uh, important than uh, than change. Uh, change is uh, is what makes uh, people go further. Um, you know, the routine of uh, of uh, of things is what is slowing down. So sometimes we need to slow down and uh, and enjoy the routine. Uh, but change is really uh, for me an accelerator. Health equity. Um, you know, I have my roots in uh, in Africa, um, so uh, I think that uh, there is a duty, uh, human duty, to bring health everywhere on Earth, um, and I believe this is uh, one of the missions uh, we would love. Uh, uh, pharma, uh, perhaps being a little bit more uh, um, vocal about, uh, and that's. Uh, that's something that is still, uh, you know, a coming issue. Um, do, do you think data and all that we're saying, generative AI, all the access to, to, to those preventive and also predictive uh, models to better healthcare will help from this? Or do you see it as actually the data that we have is not representative of all the communities in the world and thus is biased by itself. How, how do you think about those? No, we, we, we talked before about the fact that data, should it be raw data or, uh, or intelligent data? Because at the end, you know, it recycles. So, you know, what we, what we get from ChatGPT is new data that can be used to feed another system. So data at the end, as we said, uh, if it's in silo, uh, it will be an instrument more. If it's transparently shared, it will be a tool of performance. And um, and as the same for uh, for uh, you know the the most uh, advanced way to uh, to produce data, um, if it is shared, um, it will become a, a good thing to spread more equity, more let's say. Um, Really to bring more power, to empower people who have not necessarily the capacity to uh, to get access to data. So I think it goes in the right direction anyway. Uh, there are dangers to it, but uh, at the end of the day, we talk about sharing knowledge, and uh, knowledge is uh, the most powerful, uh, um, let's say, asset of uh, of any human being. The last one is spread love in organizations. I mean, transparency is extremely important. That's the way I see it. Uh, to have the courage of uh, of being transparent and honest, um, I believe is the base for uh, for a healthy and sane relationship. Not always easy. Not always easy. You don't do this. You don't do everything day one. You know, uh, even love needs to be built uh, as well. Uh, because uh, we, no one is, uh, they won't, they will never be perfect love. There will be always people learning to to live with each other. But I think transparency is a, is a good way to uh, to accelerate this. Any final word of wisdom, uh, Mokhtar, for healthcare leaders around the world? I mean, for me, uh, I, I strongly believe about uh, the fact that uh, the more those organizations will be clear about their data, the more uh, they will be doing uh, best decisions, good decisions, um, healthy decisions, uh, as opposed to uh, to you know fill the gaps with uh, with uh, guess, second guess, and and biased uh, point of view. Uh, so. You know, understanding the data, sharing the information, the analysis, and uh, and uh, having an unbiased view on everything um, is the, the the best way to, uh, I believe, uh, be a good leader. Well, Mukhtar, thank you so much for being with me today and for this great chat. Thanks, Naji. Thank you so much for the discussion. Thank you all for listening to Spread Love and Organizations podcast. 
Subscribe and connect with us on spreadloveio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Most importantly, spread love in your organizations and spread the word around you to inspire others and amplify this movement our world so desperately needs.